Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome back to the, as I would say, the Ibn Abay Midrash, but we are not. We are still guests in Eretz Chemda, where we learn here every single morning. Well, not exactly every single morning, but Sundays through Wednesdays. And you're invited, if you're in Yerushalayim, to join us. Uh, I just want to mention, before we even get started, a few very important points. Number one, this is a big repetition, and that is for those who are listening, and they should know where to find the original Hebrew sheets. We think it's very important to learn the original Hebrew. So the sheets look like this without the colors, and you can find the link below where you could um, access the original Hebrew sheets for Parshas Kadoshim according to the Kliyakar. We're using the Kliyakar as the basis for our discussion, and it would be great if you followed in the Hebrew. Uh, also, previous classes, there are links to previous classes also in the description box where you'll find the link to the Hebrew sheets as well. If you'd like to join us um, on the Skype call, just send me an email, and if you would like us to send you the English um, sheets that are basically just the sources that we're going to be using in English so you don't have to flip through all the books to find what you're looking for. So as I mentioned before we start, I just want to mention that we are praying desperately, right, for the success of Israel over its enemies. And there are people who are putting their life on the line and uh, we should have them all in mind, not only those who are in the, in the, in the front lines, but even those who are um, unfortunately in the hospital. Uh, so we're praying for everybody. I just want to mention in today's news, right, just to catch up in case you didn't know, that there's a president of the United States of America in the year 2024, I don't know when you'll be watching this, um, who is helping us to fulfill a messianic prophecy. As we know, Bilam, Bilam, he, when he prophesied, he really wanted to not bless us, but he ended up blessing us. So uh, some of his words, and I'll quote them now, because they turned in, they're supposed to be blessings in the messianic times. And it says in Numbers 23.9, it says, Hain am levadad yishkon, which means that this is a nation that shall dwell alone. And the latter part of the verse, Ugoyim lo yitchashav. Now, the interesting thing is what Rashi has to say about that. So let me just flip through. We said it's, um, it's uh, Numbers 23.9. I think that you can meditate on it. I'm only going to go through it quickly because it really has nothing, it's not per pertinent necessarily. No. It's always pertinent to the Parsha, but it's not what I want to discuss here in the next 45 minutes to an hour. <clears throat> so I want you to take time and learn these Rashis, understand the prophecies of Bilaam. And uh, Rashi quickly will say to us, as soon as I find it, it's 23 of Bamidbar of Numbers, verse 9. And Rashi says over there, on this verse. He says a lot of things. <clears throat> but the verse begins, from its origin, I see a rock like, and the hills do I view it. Behold, it is a nation that will dwell in solitude and not be reckoned among the nations. So I want you to hear the, the Rashi, going back a thousand years ago. And he bases everything on our Masora. He's not making anything up, but he is explaining according to our tradition. When Bilaam says, from its origin, I see it rock-like, he's saying, I look at their origin, meaning from the very beginning of their roots, and I see them entrenched and strong as these rocks and hills by means of the patriarchs and the matriarchs. So our origins begin with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Alea. And when it says, behold, it is a nation that will dwell in solitude, that is, what their, that is what its ancestors earned for it, to dwell in solitude. <clears throat> now we understand that Abram was an Ivri, 
And Ivri means they crossed over. They, tr- they, they went over to a different place. In fact, we left the place of darkness and slavery, even for them, because there was a Vodazar there. And Avram came to a place of spiritual enlightenment. He came to Eretz Yisrael. He came to this land. So it's well documented. And the nation will dwell alone. And I said there's a president, maybe I should, I should mention his name. We can call him Bedin to a certain extent. There's, there's some judgment involved. The heart of the king is in the hand of Hashem. I don't think he has uh, the smarts and the wherewithal to, to make this happen. And then at the end, listen to this, Ubegoyim lo yitchashav, right? They will not be recommend, uh, re- reckoned or counted amongst the nations. This is to be understood that they will not be annihilated. The Jewish people will never be annihilated with the other nations. As it says, if I'm mistaken, it's in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11. Part of that verse says, For I will effect annihilation among all the nations. But the Jewish people are not counted amongst the nations when it comes to being annihilated. Our verse alludes to the fact that at that time they are not counted with the rest of the nations. That's right. We are not counted amongst the rest of the nations and one should not be upset about that. Rashi brings an alternative explanation. When they are rejoicing, that means the Jews. When the Jews are rejoicing, no nation rejoices with them. Okay. And uh, that's based on a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 12. Hashem will guide them in solitude. Hashem badad yinchanu, yanchenu. And when the nations are in a good state, I know you're not going to like this, uh, Mr. Non-Jew. But when the nations are in good state, they, Israel, will eat with each one of them, and it is not entered into their account. In other words, we will consume. But let's not go there right now. That is the, I'm going to call it consolation. When we hear news that a nation who we already purchased our ammunition from in order to annihilate our uh, enemy has decided to delay it, there will be an accounting, as I said. There will be Biden. Biden. Okay. So let's start with the Kliakar in Parshish Kedoshim, which is chapter 19, verse 2. And it says over there, Speak to the entire congregation. Da ber el kol adat b'nei Israel. V'yamartalem, you shall say to them, Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy. And then God says, Ki ani, ki kadosh ani Hashem elokeichem, for I am holy. Hashem, your God. Interestingly enough, what do we see here? Many times Moshe gathered the Jewish people together. It seems, we're going to see in Medrash, that when he gathered everyone together, people could call in sick. It was no big deal. You could say, I'm not coming today. I have a headache or I just don't feel like it. No big deal. In this Parsha, where Moshe spoke to Kol Adat Bnei Israel. Every single Jew had to show up, had to be there. Rashi says this teaches us that this passage was stated in the Hakahal, in the assembly of the entire congregation, because why was it so necessary? No excuses, you had to show up. Because most of the fundamental teachings of the Torah are dependent on it, on this Parsha. Now, what do we see in this Parsha? The Kleokar actually explains how all the Ten Commandments are in this Parsha. But there's many other lists of what is important. And as we know, the Ahavta L'Reicha Chomocha, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is also in the Parsha. Okay, we'll see Shabbos, we'll see Kibbut Ave'em, but you could say that the idea of love your neighbor as yourself is one of the fundamental teachings of the Torah. Or you could say the Ten Commandments are, or you can say various important mitzvahs are encapsulated in the Parsha. So let's begin with the Kliakar. That All we read was the verse, 
and Rashi on the verse that we will be dealing with in the Kliyakar, and he says like this, Daber el kol adat, we're translating that as everyone else, as what? As the entire assembly. But the Kliyakar is going to take us on a little bit of a detour. He says, Parat kol adat, specifically, or uniquely, or particularly, these words, kol adat, every Jew, every person of the assembly, he says, and he brings a Gemara from Megillah, which I actually want to study a little bit with you. He says, ki ein eda pachot miasara. You don't have a congregation, whatever an eda is, an assembly of people, assembly of Jews, with less than ten. And not only that, the Gemara continues, Ein davar she pachot miasara. There are no words or things of holiness with less than ten. The Jewish people are called Yidin. Yidin means Yud, Yudin. The, the, basically, we're talking about the letter Yud. I'm just going to paraphrase a few ideas here and then get back into the clear car. But why is it so important? You come to a Beit Knesset, a shul, a synagogue, and you see they're kind of uh, waiting for the 10th guy to arrive so they can begin their prayers. That amazing, right? They sit down for a meal and they're making sure there's, if there's 10, they uh, bring out Hashem's name. So Hashem's name is going to be mentioned on a different level when there are 10 people. Jews are called Yidden, 10. Our actual name, besides the whole word I gave over the idea that Yehuda means gratitude, that's for sure. So we are the grateful ones. We make 100 brachas a day. Amen. But we're called Yidden because of this Yud. What is the Yud? The Yud is like a hook. First of all, it's the only letter that's not sitting on the bottom line. It's raised above, so there's something spiritual in nature of the Yud. It's like a hook, and what it does, it's a 10, it's the number 10. So it hooks that which is the singular, like in, in, in Arabic numerals, that's what we use, that's correct? One, two, three, four, up till nine. They're single digits. And then we have 10 as a double digit, but in Hebrew it's a single digit, but it's a hook. It's the hook between the singular, the individual, and the klal, and the community. We're going to talk about how important community is, and yeah. what that's, to, at least to the Jewish people. Yeah. Okay, so I, I'm really not going in depth. I suggest you listen to other shirim that have, uh, the Maharal does an amazing job of describing the holiness and the uniqueness of the letter Yud, or the number 10. But what we read so far was when God says, Kol Eda, according to the Kliyakar, he seems to be saying that what did Moses do? He made sure that he spoke to every group. It's true. Not, there was no individuals uh, that missed it. Everybody had to show up. And then the, last, the next line says, al Ken Amar Khan, that's why it says here in our Parsha, Daber el kol adat b'nei Yisrael, el kol eda the eda to each and every group of people. Shehi you, you don't have to turn the page because yours is all on one page. Aidei shehu kedushim, that you shall be holy. Now it's not exactly a command form, but it is inferred this is something one should do. Aidei shehem mutarim lekol davar shebegedusha. And through being an Ada, through being a community, only then can we invoke Hashem's name in the way that we do. And I'll describe it really quickly for those who know and been to a shul. You're talking about Baruch Hu, you're talking about Kaddish, you're talking about Kedusha, uh, you're talking about Kriya Satora, you're talking about the blessings of the, 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 blessings of the priest, Birkat Kohanim. There's a whole list, and there's a Mishnah that describes all these things, and I mentioned already benching, there's a difference between nine or ten people, whether you invoke Hashem's name or not. Asher bo mikadshim shemo yisbarach, because through it, through the community, we can sanctify God's name, and that's why he says, ki kadosh ani, for I am holy. Now, we're going to see what that means, because God is going to compare and say, he's holy, and you should be holy, 
there's something um, to contrast, and we'll talk about it. The next paragraph, and besides this, I really want to go into the Gemara of Megillah, and it says like this, very important. So even though the Mishnah just described all these different things you need to have ten for, Kriya Torah, right, Birkus Kohani, and benching for, with ten, to invoke Hashem's name. But the Gemara asks, now before I even go into this, most of us know from our education that the idea of having ten people, we learned from the Maraglim. There were twelve altogether, but two of them were really righteous, and that was Yoshua ben Nun and Kali ben Yefuna. They were outside of the, of the ten, and yet the Torah calls them an Ada. Now, I think it's very strange, and I hope you guys would admit, why should we learn from such a negative source? But when I read this Gemara, it's actually double negative, because we actually learn first from Korach as a Gezer Shava. A Gezer Shava is a, a word analogy that you can only get from Mount Sinai that Moses passed on to his students and, and whatnot. So you can't just make up, oh, well, this word says the same word here and it's the same word there. Very nice in philosophy and very nice in um, trying to get you know, an, an understanding of a word, but not in terms of halacha. It only works when you have a masora, meaning that it was handed down tradition from father to son or from rebbe to student. So going back to here, there's actually a double Gezer Shava from Korach, then to the Meraglim, based on a, a verse uh, in our Parsha. Now that's very odd that we're taking it from such a negative source. You'll be happy to hear what the Yerushalmi says, and then you'll try to understand why we actually paskin like the Bavli and not the Yerushalmi. Okay, so what do we see here? The Gemara begins by saying that Hanimani Mile, Mana Hanimile, from where do we learn these words from? Said Rabbi Chia Barab in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. We have the Pusik in Vayikra, Leviticus 23.32. V'nikdashti betoch b'nei Yisrael. Right? I will be sanctified betoch. Keep that word in mind. Also the word b'nei Yisrael. God says, I will be sanctified betoch. Amongst, inside, within, b'nei Yisrael. And here we learn, Shekol, Davar Shebegedusha, any mentions, any kind of mentioning of things of holiness, especially when we're sanctifying God, lo ye pachot miyasara. It's not to be done with less than ten. But we don't really know the source yet. I mean, we have a statement, but how do you know it's ten? So the Gemara asks, my mashma, where is it inferred that you're talking about ten people? It's very nice that you brought me this idea. So here is where Rabbi Chia brings the Gezer Shava, Toch, Toch. Ksiv Hacha, here, like we just said, in, um, in verse 22, 32 in Vikra, by, that's actually next week's Parsha. The Nikdashti Betoch Benesha, I will be sanctified amongst the Jewish people. And then over here, by the Maraglim, they were warned. Moshe and Aaron were warned, and, and they warned everyone else, stay away from Korach. He badlu mitoch. See the word mitoch ha'edahazot. Separate yourself from this congregation. And then the Gemara says, Asya, there's another Gezer Shava of Eida Eida. It's written over there by the Maraglim, how long is this going to, uh, evil uh, group of people going to be around? Malaholon, so too the Ada is said, we just said by the uh, Maraglim, we know there were a Sarah. There were actually 12, but two of them were outside. That would be Yoshua and Caliph. And since Ada is used over there, okay, so um, here too, in here too, meaning back in Parshas, Korach also used the word Ada. Therefore, you know, even though Korach had 253 people, nevertheless, a minimum, the minimum of an Ada is 10. So therefore, you would know that if you were just amongst 10 uh, people of Korach's congregation, you would have to stay away from them. That's the, the command. Now, interestingly enough, there's some very... Um, 
good comments, and I just want to look in the Hebrew, in num- in the footnote number 18 and number 19. And you know, just look at 19 instead because of time. And this is very interesting. Maybe I just say it out loud and, and not read it, but basically, okay, I'll read it. Hakatuv rimaz the Varsh Gedusha. So this verse is actually hinting that words of holiness, yeah, Tzarich Asara, you need ten, like in Parshas Meraglim, just like we learned in, in the, uh, the spies. In order, Kedei Lahashmi Enu Sha'af Im Yesh Beinehem Rushayim, because this is very important, if there were evil people in the synagogue, we don't kick them out. We actually count them in. They're part of the ten. And we're going to see that's why it's very important that the Bavli Paskins like that and understands the Gezer Shava from Korach and the Meraglim. Um, now there is a little, of a, a, a little bit of a problem if someone is desecrating Shabbos in public. So there's a whole question, and I'd like to just elaborate on it. Rav Moshe Feinstein said that would be the limit already. There's a limit of what evils one may do and to be considered evil. However, the Rabbeinu Vachaya, so he brings down in the name of uh, Rabbeinu Yaakov that actually the better source would be from the Jerusalem Talmud. Ready for this? There's actually the word toch. In, in, um, when, in, it's in Genesis. I know I have it here somewhere. Actually, on the English source sheet, I should have it. And... You guys with me? Yeah, it's number nine. Look in Genesis 42, verse 5. So who went down? How many brothers went down to Egypt to try to find provisions? They're really also looking for Yosef, right? So obviously Yosef wasn't one of the brothers that went down, and Binyamin wasn't one of the brothers that went down. So there were ten brothers that went down. It says the sons of Israel came to purchase among those who came. For the famine in the land, there was a very strong famine in Eretz Canaan. Lishmor batoch haboim. The word batoch. So the way this comment is going to explain it is that actually they had, they actually had a, um, a masora as well. Toch, toch. But it didn't, according to the Rishami, it wasn't told which toch. So the Rishami learns from a positive source. These were all tzaddikim. They all did tshuva, right? They were all on the, on the level, and they went down to find provisions to bring back to Yaakov. And so isn't it strange that we learn by, from the Rishami? So I think what we did see, the difference is, according to the Rishami, you would have to say that if you get a minion together, you need to start off with 10 righteous people. You may not care who comes afterwards. Or maybe you do. But everyone has to be righteous. And according to the, the, the Bavli, no. Every Jew, there's a thing called a pintal yid. And that's also, back to the word yud, a yid. There's a point. That's why the yud is the smallest letter. It, but it doesn't get extinguished like we saw it by Bilam's uh, prophecy. The Jews will never be extinguished. Okay, so I think that's enough for the Gemara at this point. Let's go back into the clear car. Um, the truth is, I have to, I have to say once, once again, that there is another um, medrash that I really want to go into, and that's what we're going to see now in this, this paragraph. It's the second paragraph now on the page I gave. Yehikti Parsha Zu Inyan Kedushat Yisrael. Prior, right, the Hiktim as a, pre, as a preamble, as a preface, as an introduction to this Parsha, we're being introduced to the idea of the holiness of the Jewish people. What does Kedusha really mean? The word Kedosh actually means separate, going back to what we already started with. We started with this whole idea that Israel will be an Ambodad, an Amboded, a separate nation, here too. Just have the idea that, and we're going to see, what does it mean, Kedusha, the holiness? We're going to translate as holiness. Ki kamosha amra kodamat and Torah. What happened before Matan Torah in preparation? 
Well, first of all, in chapter 19 of Exodus, verse 6. So the Ten Commandments are given in chapter 20 of Exodus. So in chapter 19, God tells us, the Atem Tuli, you will be to me. Mamlechet Kohanim Vagoy Kadosh. You will be to me a holy, a, 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 a nation of priests. We're going to see what the word Kohen even means. And a Goy Kadosh, a holy nation. So just keep in mind what the clear card is saying, that there's a, like an Arparsha. We already said <coughs> the Ten Commandments are there, they're embedded. So he starts off, the Torah starts off by saying, Kad, right, Kadoshim to you, you will be holy. And then it gives you a lot of mitzvahs to do. So too, by Matan Torah itself, it says, you will be to me a holy nation and a, I'm sorry, a, 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 a priestly nation and a holy nation. And then you get the, the mitzvahs. And he says right away, Kach Parsha Zu Nir Mizu Kol Aseris Adibros. They're all embedded in the, the, the Parsha itself. And now we're going to see the, uh, the Medrash. So I want to quote from the Kliakar because he doesn't bring all the words and then we'll see the Medrash itself. Kedama Rebbe Levi, Ayin Bavayikra Rabba. Look in chapter 24, uh, the Medrash 5. Al Kain Hiktim Kedusha explains there's this idea of putting first this holiness. Why was it so important to say how holy we are? Lechavev Aleyem Amitzvah. I know, I know, like Jews are, um, we're shy about when it comes to are we the chosen people or not, right? I get it. We don't, what does that mean? See, if you, if you understood what it means, you wouldn't be so shy about it. It doesn't mean that we're superior. It means that we are separate. We're special. We're different. Well, again, I don't want to use the word special. I don't want to use, superior is a word used in the Torah to describe us, but I'm using the word kadosh right now. That we are holy. Holy means separate. We have responsibilities. We have a mission. We have a direction. Forward, and we know where we came from. Backwards. So if you're told that you have more responsibility, I'm going to tell you, my father taught me, she lived, be living, live and be well, that you, 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 want, you want special privileges? I said, yeah, of course. He says, you know what comes along with special privileges? responsibilities. I learned this as a young child, and I hope that's what it means to be a Jew. Okay? We have some people in the room who are in the process of converting. Yeah, there are privileges, but they come hand in hand with responsibilities. Alkein hiktim kedusha, as we just said, lechave v'leim and mitzvah. Lomar, meaning to say, sha'al yedehem, that through the mitzvahs themselves, it's kind of like a vicious, not a vicious circle, but a, what would you say the opposite? A really good circle, an everlasting circle, Yizkulamal Sekadusha. In other words, God gave us more mitzvahs to give us more merit. So we already made the right choice by being chosen, and therefore we were, it was very endearing to us to do the mitzvahs, which would only bring us to a higher level. Now, do not ever say that this holiness is such a small thing. I know anybody who's on the outside looking in, that's the easiest way, right? Just to say it doesn't mean anything. But God himself says, Ki kadosh ani, that God himself is holy. And he ain't no small cracker either. It's a rhetorical question that it should be so small in your eyes that you can compare the creation to the creator, but Hashem himself does. He says, you should be holy, and as I am holy, and it's a big, big deal. The Rebbeseinu Zal Amru, so the, the rabbi said in the Medrash, and we're going to see this Medrash, Kol makom shetim segeder le'erva, any place that you find, how did we say the word kadosh? Kadosh meant separate. Any place that you find some type of restraining or fence, fence against illicit sexual relations, erva, nakedness, but it's, a, it's used in terms of uh, the sins uh, regarding sex. So any place you find restraining or 
fences, there you find Kedusha. You get it? It, so, it makes so much sense that the word Kadosh is to be separate. But that's where you find holiness. Ukvar Yadata, something you, you already know, that the language, Lashon Geder, the very expression of offense, Mar al Davar Hamutar, it's actually reflecting or teaching an idea of something that's permissible to you, mitzad hadin, according to the law. V'oisim siyag v'geter, but you're making a fence. L'hitrachech min iser. I just want to go back to the original thing we saw. Rashi actually said, kadoshim to you, to separate yourself from that which is forbidden. The Ramban says, actually, separate yourself from that which is permissible. And he probably gets it from Gemara Yavamos, which we'll see shortly. But the Medrash actually says it also. Al Ken Amru, therefore, it says, Shakol Makom, Sha'ata Motze Geda Erva, any place that you find some type of a fence, a security against uh, sexual immorality. I'll give you an example. So in the Torah, we know from Sota that even a husband who's just suspecting his wife, a married woman, from being secluded with a man is it's actually a big problem. It's forbidden from the Torah for a married woman to be secluded with a man. King David, in his genius, made, we're going to call it a rabbinic law. It was his base then. He put it up for adoption and it was accepted. And it's accepted by all of Am Yisrael. That even yichud, even seclusion with a single woman is forbidden but it's only forbidden midr rabbanan, meaning, I don't mean like only as in being lenient, I mean that one should know, whenever we hear laws, we have to know they're from the Torah or they're from the rabbis. It's because it says, you shall not add to the Torah. Okay, the Torah does not forbid the, relation, the, uh, the yichud of a single woman, but it's 100% forbidden from the rabbis. And that is an example of making your, making your gather making a fence against the erva. And that's where you find holiness. Ki kol kedusha, as we said, anything that is holiness, now holiness really means separate, I know af hamutar, means separate from that which is actually permissible to you. Okay? Just like Chazal say in Yavamos, kadesh otzmecha b'mutar lach, that in order to become holy, you must separate yourself from that which is permissible. And the, and the, the clear card brings down that the holiness of a Nazir, a Nazir is likened to a Kohen Gadol. Amazing. He came from a place of contemplation. How can I make myself a better person? Whether I'm drinking too much or I'm too vain, I look in the mirror too much, whatever his, or her, right, his issue is, um, this is going to prove to us, because he wants to become holier, the truth is, at the end, he has to bring a sin offering. But in the meantime, uh, he has made forbidden to him wine, anything from grapes, uh, haircuts, going into a cemetery, and whatnot. But Makram Shiniz Kargeder Erva Atamotze Kedusha. So you see from the Nazir a place where you have these fences, that's where you find. Holiness. Now, the Kliyakar says it's also true by Matin Torah. Shavuos, we're counting the days in the Omer towards this great and awesome day of the revelation of the giving of the Torah. What was told to us to do three days before Matin Torah? In Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. Al tig shu el ha'isha. Do not approach. Do not even approach your wives. You must stay away from them for three days. The truth is it also applies to the women. Um, I just look at number eight. Is that right? No. No, 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 no. I have it here somewhere. Look in the source sheet. Oh, look in number seven where it says Exodus 19, 15. He said to the people, be ready for three days. Do not go near a woman. Rashi says, for the end of three days, right? Be ready for three days. So then three days, you'll be able to receive the Torah. I'm not going to get into this idea that Moses 
added an extra day. That I suggest listening to Rabbi Breitowitz. He spoke about it, and I'll try to put the link down below. This is a, the, the view of Rabbi Yossi, who says the Torah was given on the 7th of Sivan, which it probably was on that particular year. Uh, according to the one that says the Ten Commandments were given on the 6th of the month, however, Moses did not add anything. I want to go down to the next one. Do not go near to a woman to have intimacy with her. For all these three days of preparation, in order that the woman may immerse himself, herself on the third day and to be pure to receive the Torah. I'm not going to get into this, but if anybody that's aware of what a, a, um, the, um, the Gezera of Ezra HaSofer was, uh, in terms of men going to the mikveh after relations, the same thing would apply for women. And uh, I'm not going to go much more into that. But basically it says like this, if they have intercourse within three days, a woman could involuntarily emit semen, meaning the semen that was injected into her by the male, after her immersion and become unclean again. So therefore she would only uh, immerse after three days. After three days have elapsed since intercourse, however, the semen has already become putrid and is no longer capable, capable of fertilization. Therefore it would be pure when, from contaminating uh, from the woman if it would become emitted, if it would uh, exit her body. Okay, we're almost at the end of the clear car, and I want to go into the medrash. I re it's so fundamental what we do here that you should hear what the medrash says. The last thing we just mentioned that God said, right, told Moses, tell the people to not approach your wives. Remember, their wives are certainly permissible to them. Do you realize the Jewish people are very holy people? They separate from their wives for X amount of days per, per month. Of course, this is only uh, at certain periods of time during her life. Uh, and it also says in chapter 18, verse 6, which deals with all the lists of forbidden relations, Lo tikravu legalot erva, do not approach to reveal the, the nakedness. So what does it mean? Don't approach. Kriva. It's the approaching. It's only the approaching that brings to the illicit relation. So if you can hold yourself, so to speak, control yourself from the very beginning, you don't get to step two. Okay? This is a fence and a, a type of offense for, against illicit sexual relations. So too, by the Kohanim, the Kohanim are limited in who they can marry. And Isha Zoyna of Chalala, some type of desecrated woman, Midabrim Hamutarim Lisrael. These women are certainly permissible for a regular Jew like myself to marry, but not for a Kohen. A Kohen Sari Geder Vesiag. And remember, we're called Mamlechet Kohanim, meaning halakhically, in, in reality, it's only the Kohanim that are uh, restricted in terms of marriage, but the whole concept of elevating ourselves to be a Goy Kadosh, a Mamlechet Kohanim. We are obligated to create these fences. As it says, The Kohen himself is obligated to have these fences um, and forbid himself, even though a regular Jew is permissible, it's permitted, because the Kohenim are on a higher level. Okay? So the Jewish people, or Mavlechet Kohenim, were on a higher level. Now the last three or four lines, and then we're going to get into the Medrash, it says, Kedoshim to you. So our verse says, Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy. There is an inference this is a, a command. It's not an actual command, it's more of a hodat devarim. But anyway, he says, Yesh b'shma'uta lashon sifoy. You can feel a sense of a command, as well as hodat inyan, as well as just an explanation. We already saw that verse in chapter 19, verse 6. Attempt you li mamlechet kohani v'goy kadosh in Exodus 19.6. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Shu hodate inyan. This is a fact. Kach hodi lehem hakadosh baruch hu matan tzcharan shal gidurim arayot. So too, Hashem is actually informing the Jewish people 
of the great reward if you make separation from sexual immorality, if you build these fences against the, the sexual immorality. That through this, that through this you will be holy to your God. So God says to us to be holy. He wants us to be holy. So when we look at this medrash, it's in Vayikra Rabbah, it's 24.5. So this is based on our verse. Speak, Daber El Kol Adat Shal. Speak to the entire assembly of the Jewish people. I'm going to stick, stick, skip the Hebrew. We're just going to try to go to the English because, except where it's necessary. So Rabbi taught this portion of the Torah, our portion, uh, Kadoshim was stated at the gathering of the entire Jewish people. We're going to see why is that important. As I mentioned in the beginning, when God gathered all the people together, when Moses gathered all the people together in other times, one could get out of it. They didn't have to show up. But here they had to show up. Okay? Because most of the basic laws of the Torah depend on it. Now we saw those words, but now we're going to explain them if you look down in the footnote 50 below, usually when God directed Moses to transmit a new law or a portion of the Torah, first, right, he said, speak to the children of Israel. <clears throat> By the way, how did it work? God told Moses to speak to the children of Israel, but first Moses was taught by God, and then he taught, he taught Aaron. And after he taught Aaron, then Aaron's sons came in. So he taught a second time. And then he called in the elders. And then he, that was a third time. And then when he called in all of Israel. But again, it was only who wanted to learn that lesson. You weren't obligated to go every time Moses spoke. It was only certain times he gathered everyone together. And people had an excuse. We call it a hall pass. Here, nobody could get a hall pass. Okay? So here when it says, speak to the entire assembly of the children of Israel which indicated the entire nation was to gather together to hear the teachings. So the Midrash would seem to be speaking here of verses found in Leviticus 19, but not necessarily 19, the rest of 19 and 20. 20 already have a new statement, Hashem spoke to Moses, saying. But over here, speak, God says, speak to the entire assembly. So the question arises, wasn't the entire Torah taught to all of Israel? We learn in the Gemara in Erevin, as I mentioned, that after learning from the Almighty, Moses taught first to Aaron, then to Aaron's sons, and then to the elders, and then finally to everyone else. So there's different opinions by the commenters uh, to this question. So the first opinion, the Sefer Zikaron and the Gur Aryeh, write that when Moses taught this portion, every individual had to be present. When he taught the other portions, individuals could absent themselves if they wished. The Mizrahi, Elio Mizrahi writes that when Moses taught the other portions, meaning in the fourth teaching, he taught all the, all the Jews, he didn't teach all of Israel, but rather to one group at a time, and that would fit in well. The Kliakar was talking about Eda Ve'eda, or Kol Ha'edut. All of the, you might have spoken to all the different groups at different times, but today you have to speak to all the groups. However, came the current portion, he had to teach them all together. And the third suggestion, it may be suggested that unlike the rest of the Torah, which was taught to all of Israel only after it had already been taught three times to smaller groups, this current Torah portion was taught the first time to everybody, not split up to Aaron, his sons, and the elders, but it was taught the first time to everybody. Now, there's another statement that we need to look at. What does it mean that this has within it the most basic or fundamental laws of the Torah? They're all de that the Torah is dependent on. So, source 51, for that reason, the Torah portion was given the special honor of being transmitted in front of the full gathering of the Jewish people. Alternatively, it was for that reason that it was critical that all of Israel hear this portion together rather than separately. So what? If you heard it separately, what can you always do? You know, when you come back, you're Kavrusa, and you say, I heard this, and you say, I heard that. But if we were all there, we all heard the same thing. You can't really argue about that. 
So if a doubt arose as to what Moses said, no group would be able to say they did not hear what another group claims to have heard. We were all there. You, you can't get around it. The, the Maharazu enumerates what does it mean, basic laws. They refer to here as observing the Sabbath, honoring the parents, refraining from robbery, not taking revenge or bearing a grudge, loving your neighbor as yourself, which we all know is a major principle of the Torah. And um, it's tantamount to the entire Torah. The Haftal Rechmocha, Rabbi Akiva says it's a Klal Gadol Torah. And whereas the rest, as Hillel explains to the convert, that's what he says basically in different words, but that the Haftal Rechmocha and the rest is commentary. It's just an elaboration. The rest of the Torah is just an elaboration of it. Um, it says here, look at the insight. Now, this is unbelievable. I happen to have a particular, I'm not even, not even sure I can call him a student yet, but someone who has approached me and asked me a lot of questions. Um, when he heard that if you want to convert, you have to move to a Jewish community, he was a little bit upset. He, he couldn't understand why, and I think that I failed to communicate to him. I tried my best to explain, and I think he, he appreciated some of my answers, but I think, if you're listening, that uh, this will do it more justice. What does it mean? He says, it's a portion for the public. That's what it means, kadoshim to you, and he spoke lifnei kol adat b'nei Israel. So it's very important that the public hear it. In its plain sense, our Midrash sees the public transmission of this Torah portion as a tribute to its singular importance. Many commentators, however, find various shades of symbolic meaning. And that's what we're going to go through, a whole list. So the Chassam Sofer notes that the salient feature of this portion is its first directive, Kedoshim Tihiyu, the fundamental mitzvah, which enjoins us to raise ourselves above the vanities of earthly life. It's sometimes mistaken as a mandate to withdraw completely from human society, right? People think I could be holy, I'll sit on a mountaintop, or I'll go out into the, uh, the Amazon, I don't know, whatever, and be on my own and meditate. And I'll just become a perfect human being without any friction, without any interaction. This is how I can really become great. So not true. In fact, it's, it's precisely the high-minded members of the nation, those wise enough to reject society's mindless pursuit of wealth, honor, comfort, and pleasure, that God wants to live among and be near the people so they can teach, guide, and inspire them. Admittedly, this might come to some, at some spiritual cost. Right? The righteous person sitting on that mountain meditating by himself, oh yeah, he can become real spiritual. And if he descends the mountain and is involved with everybody else, of course there's going to be a cost. But if they mingle with the masses for the right reasons, they will find themselves able to interact with the people on an everyday level while abstaining privately from unnecessary pleasures and conducting their lives, their inner life, on a much higher plane. In short, the mitzvah to be holy is not meant to splinter the nation or its communities by encouraging people to live in isolation. No, no, no. It was to drive home this point that Moses brought the entire nation together then before communicating this Torah portion. In this way, he made clear that to strive for holiness, the Torah way, one must remain part of the community. Because most of the basic laws of the Torah, in terms of their fulfillment by the people, depend on the existence of close ties between the nation and its leaders. There's, there's a lot, but there's some really important points, and I hope you'll listen to the end, because one of the most important points, it's just a few minutes. The Shari Simcha focuses more broadly on the first verse of the portion, which commands us to be holy because holy am I, Hashem your God. The implication, as the Ramban explains, is that God wants us to be holy because He is holy. And if we are to cleave to Him as He intended for us, we must acquire a share of His holiness. Success in this endeavor, however, cannot be attained by one individual working alone for two reasons. First, if one's contemporaries are leading unholy lives, 
their negative influence will inevitably affect the righteous among them to some degree and prevent them from reaching the level of, per level of per perfection they seek. It's for that reason, writes the Shla, the Shla Kodesh, that the Talmud says about one sage, Shmuel HaKatan, that he was worthy of having the divine presence rest upon him, meaning of experiencing prophecy. But he lived long after the prophetic era ended, except that his generation was not worthy of it. He was worthy of it, but the generation was not. A second idea, that this is, this, there is the Torah principle of arvus. Arvus means all Jews are responsible for each other which holds every Jew responsible for the spiritual well-being of every other Jew. According to this principle, and I would say drum roll please, but there's no tables here, that, that according to this principle, the blame of one Jew's sin is shared by anyone who could have prevented it by raising their spiritual awareness of that individual or the community at large. It says in Yoshua, in Joshua, Achan, it says, we know that after the lottery, it pinpointed it was only him that sinned. One person sinned. And yet the verse says, Israel sinned. And we lost 36 soldiers in the, in the war at Ai, right after Yericho. Happens to be that uh, the question, what did he actually do besides thiever? He was, he was a thief. But he also, it was also on Shabbat. Okay, in this manner, it is possible for an individual Jew who is free of his own sins to nevertheless be sullied by the sins of many other Jews. So you might say, oh, I'll just sit on the mountain. Why should I be sullied? Either way, this Torah, this Torah portion's theme of holiness, perfection, and the closeness of God's presence is not meant for individual Jews. First of all, it's a community effort. When, if you're, you know, I'm not preaching here, like if there's a bunch of sinners and I'm innocent, if I don't confront you, if I don't give you rebuke, if I don't help you know the proper path, that's when I'm responsible. The mitzvah, tochiach, when you the mitzvah of giving rebuke specifically says in, you give the rebuke in order that you are not going to carry the person's sins. So when, once you have the ability to give rebuke and you do give rebuke, that's when you're, not re, you're no longer responsible. Okay, the Shem Mishmu highlights the importance of mitzvah observance in the pursuit of Jewish holiness. As it says in, well, it doesn't have the verse here, but you shall perform all my commandments and be holy to your God. Aside from this basic message that performing the commandments renders one holy, as we spoke about, makes an additional point with the small but significant all. It says, you shall perform all my commandments. I want you to understand I have run into these Christian missionaries. They say, how can you be a fulfilled Jew? You can't do all the mitzvahs, whether because there's no temple, whatever. They don't know what they're talking about, right? It says here, right? God says, you shall perform all my commandments and be holy to your God. That's true. So how do we do this? You, right? You do this. You do a few mitzvahs and I do a few mitzvahs and you do a few mitzvahs. It's not, it's not a little thing that I'm talking about. Many mitzvahs are only for men. Some mitzvahs are only for women. Some are only for farmers. Some are only for Kohanim. Some are only for Levine. Some are only if you want to get a divorce. You don't have to get a divorce, right? There's, like, there's very specific mitzvahs that are only for certain people at a certain time. There's ne God never intended one person to fulfill all 613. And yet we're told that the body itself has 613 different parts. 248 bones parallel to the positive, the Dues and 365 negatives, they're going to be parallel, well, don't, parallel to different sinews and muscles in the body and organs. What are we talking about here? That's the human, that's like the, that's the collective of the Jewish people. I mentioned before how Hashem has 72 three letter names. There are 72 names of God, 72 three letter names of God. You will find them in the splitting of the sea, in the song of the sea, in, in uh, Exodus chapter 14, verse 19, 20, and 21. It's the only place in the entire Torah that you have three consecutive verses with 72 letters. So how it works, you take in verse 19 the first letter, verse 20 you take the last letter, and 21 the first letter, and that is one word. That's one of God's 72 holy names. 
And you do, again, the second letter of 19, the second from the last letter of 20, and then the second letter from the beginning of 21, and that's the second name. Verse 8, sorry, the 18th name. We all know the famous verse that the mitzvahs, you shall live in them. This is what gives you life, and you should choose life. So you shall live in them. Chai behem. The mitzvahs are to live through, not to die for, but to live for. And I say this to anybody who's out there who's willing at this point, who might be secular and say, you know what? I'm going to come to the defense of the Jewish people. I'm willing to die for the Jewish people. That's a tremendous level. But you can live for the Jewish people. Yeah. You can do mitzvahs while you're alive. Man. So don't hold yourself back. I appreciate that you're willing to die for me. <coughs> so the 18, chai is 18, life itself. The 18th name of God of the 72 letters is Kli. Kli, not the Kli Akar, but Kli is in Kohanim Levim Yisraelim. The way the Jewish people live through the mitzvahs is through a conglomerate, through the very fact that we have a community, from the very fact that you do some and I do some and he does some and she does some. Right. It's only through that we're high behem. We're, we're truly a Kli. We're truly a, a vessel in which we could perform the mitzvahs. Hear what he says. To achieve complete holiness, one must sanctify every part of his being, all 248 limbs, 365 sinews. The key to reaching this goal lies in the 248 positive commandments and the 365 prohibitions, each of which is designed to perfect and sanctify a corresponding part of the human organism. But how does one perform all these mitzvahs? It is impossible because many of them apply only in specific areas, eras, or only to specific people or groups. Some are for Kohanim, some are for Lithium, some are for Yisraelim. Some are only for men, others for women, yet others are for kings or judges. You know, there's, there's laws just for kings, as you all know. There is but one solution. I would say drum roll, please, again, but there are no tables. By attaching yourself by attaching oneself to the Jewish people at large, one can benefit from sanctifying influence. One can benefit from the sanctifying influence of the mitzvah performed by other Jews. It's true that one Jew sinning is going to affect me. How much more so if one Jew performs a mitzvah is going to affect me? Uh, as I lost my place. Um, <laughs> and it follows then that complete holiness requires close ties to the community a strong sense of belonging to a unified nation what do we have? every flag only through unity we will win this has to be in our kishkas in the deepest uh, recesses of our minds our soul, our body Okay, make it a reality how to figure out to continue this, uh, this unity. Well, Biden <laughs> had a little bit of an answer for us, right? So he's making sure that we're going to live alone. When you're living alone with a bunch of group of people, you, you know how much you need them. So let's continue this, this last point here. Um, it follows then that the complete holiness requires close ties to the community, a strong sense of belonging to a unified nation. To emphasize this requirement, the Torah portion on the subject of holiness was given to an all-inclusive gathering of Jews. No exceptions. Nobody had a hall pass. Nobody can get out of it. Um, I do want to read just the next few lines. I think it's important, then we'll end. Rav Yaakov Naiman from Dark and Musar discerns another message in the public transmission of the mitzvah to be holy. People tend to think, this is what you were talking about, Yehuda, that holiness is a privileged state of being, accessible only to the rare individual willing to lead a secluded life devoted entirely to religious pursuits. But that is not the Torah's view. In conveying the mandate to be holy, God says to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of the children of Israel, say to them, you shall be holy. Clearly this mitzvah is meant for everyone. Its fulfillment does not entail the rejection of human society or of normal human life. Okay, so Bizrat Hashem, um, we can incorporate, we'll figure out ways to make sure that we have this 
unity at the forefront of our minds, figure out ways to make sure that it, it's real to us to start with, and that we have ways to continue it. If you need to, make a get there, make a fence to, uh, to help keep the holiness in your life and your community's life. And uh, with that, I will say, I'm looking forward, I'm sure we all are, to the, rebuild, to the gathering of the exiles. Should it happen soon in our days? Not just words, but re mamish reality. The uh, building of the Beis HaMikdash. Of course, the coming of Mashiach, which probably precedes all that, but we won't know who he is until after he has accomplished that. So, Mizrat Hashem, we shall see that this coming week. And um, I wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom, a Chodesh Tov, of course, and a, um, a great life. And we'll see you next week. <laughs> Yeah.